are sitting here at the backdrop, the city of Israel, the old city of Israel itself. Of course, the Dome of the Rock is the one thing that is just totally out of place as we realize the temple is no longer there. But nonetheless, I felt like it'd be a good place to come up onto the Mount of Olives and speak to you a little bit about the story of David. After being in Engedi yesterday and the inspiration that God gave me about Saul and how that when David saw that Saul was in the cave and God had put Saul in like a, like a deep sleep, him and his men, that they were not able to realize that David and his men were in the cave. And he takes and he cuts off the, the edge of uh, Saul's garment. And he comes out and then he announces from the other side that, to Saul that he was there. And Saul was a beautiful type of Israel. As I begin to prayerfully think about the story of David, though, I begin to realize there's so much more to David and, and, the, and the things of his life that type the Messiah. You know, generally they say that a, a son takes on his father's characteristics. You know, we know Yeshua is the son of David, spiritually speaking, but David foreshadowed his life remarkably so. Oftentimes I would think of the story of Joseph and I would think how Joseph reflected the life of Yeshua. And, and, and in fact he does. There's no doubt about it. Joseph is a beautiful reflection. And the more that I read the stories of the Bible, the more that I begin to realize that God laid the most incredible mystery was the lives of our own people that were reflecting who the Messiah was the entire time. And so I sat down and I opened up to the book of Samuel and I began to read more about the story of David, how he became king of Israel, the things that happened, and the subtleties, the smallest stories that we tell, or that we read and that we tell our children, have some of the most incredible mysteries hidden inside of them. When you go back earlier in David's life, before David is on the run, and Saul unable to recognize that the kingdom was being taken from him and being given over to another. We remember the story. In fact, let me just share the words here with you um, that Samuel says to Saul. It's in the 13th chapter. Yud Gimel from our Jewish brothers of Shemuel, Aleph, and Yud Gimel. And uh, actually in verse, uh, we could start with uh, Yud Gimel, the verse 13 as well. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandments of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now the Lord would have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. You know, we often think of Saul as that the kingdom was regarding him himself. But you have to understand that he says he would establish thy kingdom upon Israel forever. It's an eternal kingdom that he's speaking of. So without doubt, without question, Saul is a type of Israel, the nation of Israel. David indeed is a type of Yeshua, the way that God would bring the kingdom into being. And so when he takes and he grabs a hold of the garment of Samuel, later in the prophecy there, as Samuel's leaving him, when he refuses to, to kill all and bow down to the people's desires and didn't kill all the inhabitants of Gilgal, then God takes and or, or Samuel reaches, or sorry, sorry, not Samuel, but Saul reaches out, grabs the, the hem of uh, Samuel's garment, and it tears. He says, God has torn the kingdom from you and has given it to a man that is better than you. This actually reflects the fact that the Gentiles would receive the gospel. But as I mentioned to you, 
all through the life of Saul, David's men that were with him, they always wanted to kill Saul. They had it out for him. Now, in case you didn't know, Saul's men were made up of both Jews and Gentiles. A very large number of his fighting force were actually Gentiles, which types the Christian church of today, which is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And often we find it's the Gentiles that were amongst his group that wanted the life of Saul to be taken. In fact, it comes to place one part in the story here when Saul it finally does die. And the man that brings tidings to David that he, that he had died, David was angry with him so much so that he had one of his men fall upon the messenger and kill him. He said, do you think it made me happy to bring tidings that, the anoint, that God's anointed was dead? So see, we often look at the prophecies and the biblical pro prophecies that are written in here, or stories, I should say, we don't realize that they're actually prophetic. We miss this part of the story, the pro prophetic side of it. We take, for example, David, when, he first, when God first begins to deal with him, and he goes up, his father Yishe, or Yishe, however you say it, I may not pronounce that exactly right, but David's father sends him out to go check on his brother and to bring uh, some food and some wine for the captain of their, their host as well as his brothers. And when he goes there, we find out that the Philistines have their warrior, Goliath. And what's odd, that they're not really, there's not really a lot going on in the battle. But Goliath comes up, and everyone's afraid of him. All of Saul's men, all of Saul's host are afraid of Goliath. And David, he asks the question, what will be done for the man that destroys this uncircumcised Philistine? And he asks it more than once. I thought that was kind of interesting. He asks the question more than once. And it's recited to him that he will become wealthy, he'll be blessed abundantly, he will be given Saul's daughter in marriage, and the man that does it, his house shall be free. This is nothing, or I shouldn't say nothing, this is the most incredible prophetic statement written in the story of David. The whole story is foreshadowing Yeshua coming and destroying the enemy of Israel. Satan himself being destroyed. And notice the, what, what he's given. Every, every little aspect is important. Now before I get into to, with you what he's actually given, let me share this with you. Do you realize that David says to Saul, when Saul brings him in and says, you're just a youth. And this man's a warrior since his youth. It's like the devil's been around all this time, and here Yeshua comes along. And I'm talking about Jesus now. He comes along, and he's going to deliver Israel from this giant. In this case, the giant does represent the Romans. Because remember, when Yeshua comes, Rome has control of Israel. All right? Now, follow the story carefully. David recites to him about the, the lion and the bear that comes in. And how that God delivered the lion and the bear into his hands, and he slays them. He even talks about how they rose up on their two feet, and he took him by the beard and destroyed him. Do you realize what David is actually, his life is portraying? It's Daniel's vision in chapter 7 of Daniel. Remember the four beasts? One was likened to a lion, one was likened to a bear, then there was a leopard. And then finally the fourth beast, when Daniel speaks about him, he says he has teeth like iron. And he describes this beast to be so incredible. And he talks about that this beast here caused Daniel to be so afraid that even, he says, the color left his body. He became pale, in other words, when he saw the image of this beast. He saw Rome. That's what he saw. 
in David, in David's own life, David begins to reflect the destruction of the lion and the bear, which was the Babylonians and the Persians. Babylon has always was represented in the Bible as the lion, the Babylonian kingdom. The bear were the Medes of Persia. The story of Esther, the deliverance of Israel. And here David is faced with Goliath, this great big giant. Satan himself, in other words, is portrayed as Goliath. But what does Yeshua do? He comes and he defeats Goliath. He kills him. And the way Yeshua defeated Goliath in the days that he was here, the days that he was here in this city here, the days that he was on the Mount of Olives, right where I'm sitting at now, when Yeshua was here, he was making ready to defeat Goliath. His resurrection was the defeat of Goliath. Satan lost his power. Notice the man that defeated Goliath would get Saul's daughter. That was Israel. So, but isn't it interesting? Then Saul seeks David's own life. Just like Israel. Israel, the very one that was sent to deliver Israel, Saul is constantly after him, wanting to destroy him, wanting to kill him. And it, it's kind of ironic, my wife mentioned to me, she says, you know, I wonder how long that David was actually with his wife, with, with Saul's wife, you know, because he was with her for a very short period of time. I don't know. I mean, I, whether it's a day, two or three days, uh, months, whatever, I, I have to go back and read the account. I haven't got that far in the story as of yet. But you know, David did get to go be with her in his own death. When he died, he was able to be joined with her because she was still his wife. Now, Saul did give her to another. But isn't it interesting? The blindness of Saul, who represents Israel, that when God raised up the king that was to take his place, he was too blind to see who he was, to recognize who he was. And then I think of the story of Daniel and these beasts knowing that Yeshua will destroy them all. The story is just impeccable. Who David really is. Who he typed out. Every aspect of the life of Yeshua lay right there in the life of David. You know, I was sharing this with Brother Chad our producer, the brother that is working with us in the background. You'll see Chad before too long on some of the videos there. And I told Brother Chad, I said, you know, there's one thing I haven't had the chance yet to really pray about, and to seek the Lord about. But that is, how does Bathsheba play in all of this? When David types out Yeshua. I said, I haven't really gone into prayer yet, Brother Chad, regarding that. And when I was sharing with him, all these beautiful types that God was showing me about the life of David, I knew right when Brother Chad got the revelation himself, he got so excited, and he was, he, he said, I see it, I see what you're talking about. He said, my brother, it's incredible. And then I mentioned to him about the part about Bathsheba, and he says, brother, he said, that one's easy. He said, Christ became sin that he might save us. David, his sin. Now we know it was the lust of his own eyes that got him in trouble. It's not the case with Yeshua. We realize that there. But isn't it interesting? He became sin. And that part with Bathsheba, David, was his one fault that was against him. And therefore, it did bring the promise to Israel, and it's the way the Messiah came was through Bathsheba. I find it kind of ironic in the Midrash. It mentions the fact that Bathsheba, nowhere do we find any place where she ever repented for any of the sins of the acts that were committed. It really troubled the rabbis that she never confessed anything. But you know what? 
I don't think she had anything to confess to begin with. David sent for her. He was the king. What was she to do? There's a lot more that could be said about the story here of David. There's just so much that God is unfolding and revealing. How Saul types Israel today. And no doubt there's many things I forgot to tell you that God revealed to me earlier this morning. But as it comes back to my memory, I'll share with you more about this. God bless you. I'm Stephen Benjamin in the Mount of Olives, overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. Shalom.